You are Locked On Auburn, your daily podcast on the Auburn Tigers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on into Locked On Auburn, your daily Auburn Tigers podcast. I'm your host, Zach Black. And we can thank you so much for making Locked On Auburn your first listen every single day. On today's show, we're going to talk about last night's win, of course, over the Georgia Bulldogs for the Auburn basketball team. Then we will chat with Spencer McLaughlin. He hosts Locked On Ducks. We'll get kind of the Oregon perspective on the three Oregon Ducks transfers that Auburn football has received so far. And then we'll look ahead to Saturday's matchup against Kentucky with Locked On Kentucky host Lance Daw. Auburn takes down the Georgia Bulldogs 83-60. to I'm going to be honest with you. Vegas putting the line at 22 I am like, that's too many points. That's a ton of points. Uh, but a lot of folks in the locked on our discord and locked on, you know, uh, an Auburn Twitter as a whole. were like, no, Auburn is 22 points better than Georgia. And you're right. They're 23 points better. So um, pretty much a team effort across the board for the Auburn Tigers. I mean, uh, Katie Johnson at 12, including three threes with a short period of time. That was a lot of fun for him against his former team. You have to love that. Jabari Smith with 12, Zepp with three, but he had a plus minus of 13. His defensive effort was wonderful. You absolutely love that. Walker Kessler led the way with 15 points and an, an efficient 7 of 11 from the floor. So that's something that, that you have to love. And look, I think a lot of Auburn fans looking at Kessler, you know, he fouled out two games in a row. He's been good since then, and he was incredible last night as far as staying out of foul trouble. Just one foul, and it was a little bogus um, towards the end of the first half there. Alan Flanagan with 10. Wendell Green coming off the bench to score 12. And uh, let's see who else here. Uh, Jalen Williams had 13. And so then there was a big drop-off after that. Hey, props to Bruce Pearl. He kept the dogs in. I think that's pretty neat. I think it's pretty neat. A lot of people thought he would pull folks. That was kind of my, part of my argument for saying, you know, I don't know if Auburn's necessarily going to cover the the 22, but no, I, th- this team is aggressive. This team, and you hear Zepp when he, when he comes on the show talk about this, this team smells blood, and they just want to go after it. And you saw that. You saw that all the way down to, you know, Dylan Cardwell towards, you know, the the end of the game there when he was being aggressive. So this team, it, it has it all. And it's it's funny. Georgia's very bad. They're a terrible basketball team. But this Auburn team is so talented and so deep that they didn't shoot well, and they still were able to do this. I mean, looking at it, Georgia actually shot better from behind the arc than Auburn. Now, Auburn took a ton more shots. Auburn was 10 of 36 from behind the arc. That is 27.8%. That's not good. Right? I think we all can agree that that's not good. And so, you know, the fact that this team is able to do this against other conference teams, and you can kind of point to something that's extremely fixable, to get you even more excited about this basketball team. Georgia shot 38.5% from three. I mean, imagine if Auburn shoots that clip. I mean, they, they get close to 100. I mean, that, that, that'd be crazy. With you shooting 36 threes, um, Georgia only thought, uh, shot 13 threes. There were five of 13 from the floor. But still, I, I just think if you can get just a little bit better in a few different places – this Auburn basketball team is going to be unstoppable with that just relentless force of defense. Are you kidding me? Uh, Georgia had 18 turnovers to Auburn's eight. <laughs> I mean, it was never in question which team was better here. Auburn's free throw percentage going up just a little bit. They shot 78% from the charity stripe. You have to love that. And just overall 46% from the floor. Look, this Auburn team's got it going on. They, they really do. And so they're 17 and one. They're six and zero in conference play. And on Saturday, they will be going up against probably the most talented team in the league. They're not the most deep, um, but as far as just raw talent, I mean, it's Kentucky. It's you know what you see is what you get. You get a bunch of talented young dudes. This year's squad's a little different because they've got you know Wheeler who transferred there, which was Katie Johnson's teammate last year. Is the the part of the mass exodus 
from the Georgia Bulldogs last season to go elsewhere throughout college basketball. But this is a this is a a basketball team that they're going to be facing in Auburn Arena, and I'm really glad Auburn's playing this game at home because I think it's going to be the difference when it's all said and done. But this is a you know Kentucky's finding its stride. They beat a Texas A&M team last night, and A&M got up kind of big on them. And I would not be shocked if Auburn got up big on Kentucky and Kentucky found their way back in it. Kind of like that LSU game, Auburn LSU earlier in the season. But I think Kentucky is going to be a little bit more effective offensively than LSU. That's kind of what I'm predicting. And I'll talk more about this with Lance Dahl in the third segment. But I think last night was a good it was a good sign because so many folks were like, you know, they're going to be focused on Kentucky, yada, yada, yada. I don't think that's what this team is. I think this team is a little tongue in cheek here, but you know, the one and zero mentality that you hear the football program preaching, it seems like this basketball team's all over it. And so they took care of business against Georgia, even though I still don't think they played that well, this team has not peaked yet. And they got to focus and play against Kentucky. If they play like they did offensively last on Saturday, I do not think they went. They're going to have to shoot it better. They're going to have to make better passes. They're going to have to be a little bit more crisp. And obviously your mentality changes and how you play changes when you're up 20 against an inferior opponent. So like, you know, I'm trying, I'm not, I'm not being over overly critical here. In fact, I think I'm being um, positive in the fact of, look, you, you scored 83 easy against an SEC team and you know, there, there's plenty of room for improvement. So there's a lot to like about this Auburn team and strap in folks and enjoy the ride. All right. Spencer McLaughlin joins me. In just a moment, first, hey, this is it. The putt to win the tournament. If you sink it, the championship is yours. But on your backswing, your hat falls over your eyes. Is this how you're running your business? With poor visibility because you're still relying on spreadsheets and outdated finance software. To see the full picture, you need to upgrade to NetSuite by Oracle. Over 28,000 businesses already use NetSuite. For the new year, NetSuite has a new financing program for those ready to upgrade at NetSuite.com slash locked. That is NetSuite.com slash locked. Joining us now on the show, Spencer McLaughlin, the host of Locked On Ducks. And it's funny, man. It's this weird thing between Auburn and Oregon. I think it all kind of started that 2010 National Championship game, which I know we have thoughts about Michael Dyer. Um, I believe he was up. Uh, You believe he was down. But anyway. Ankle is not foot, but we'll just keep going. Sure. That's fine. That's fine. I got uh, some uh, some. 2010 stuff behind me if you're watching on youtube i I put that there just for you spencer i i was trying to just focus on the adidas on your sweatshirt and literally nothing else that was behind you that's fine i respect that i respect that so (laughs) uh but yeah you know bo nix makes his first start uh, against oregon he is now oregon's quarterback and now also in this transfer portal season auburn has gotten three oregon ducks and I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts for a few minutes here, if you don't mind, about the three former Oregon players, now current Auburn Tigers. Well, I was texting a friend of mine yesterday, and this thought came to me. I feel like we're in a college football reenactment of the movie Moneyball, where Brad Pitt says, we have become a farm system for the New York Yankees. I mean, apparently guys are just coming to Oregon only to go over to Auburn if they're not seeing the field. And look, I don't hold it against these players for – transferring they've got their reasons they're doing what's best for them like all all that all that good stuff but dj james surprised me a little bit because of the head coach that oregon is bringing in in dan lanning and dj james a guy who has has started at cornerback for really the last two seasons for the ducks now they've rotated defensively a lot in the secondary so he hasn't always been the guy like he's not on the field at all times Mikhail Wright was Oregon's number one corner for the last couple of seasons he was on the field at all times but DJ James and Dante Manning Jamal Hill these guys sort of rotated in and out but James did a lot of really good things now is he going to you know emerge into an all SEC caliber corner probably not but will Auburn fans watch him play and say this guy belongs as a starting corner, which he does. And is he going to make some plays? Yeah, I, I think he will. And another thing to remember with defensive backs is sometimes the best ones are the guys that you don't hear from very often, right? right? Because that means the quarterbacks are just not throwing the ball their way. 
DJ James is a guy who, you know, was involved pretty often over the course of a game watching him. I, I think he's a lot better defending towards the boundary. I think he's actually really, really good defending towards the boundary. Like if I, if I were a defensive coordinator, obviously I'm not, never have been, but I would definitely play him as a boundary corner to guard against the sideline. And his best play as a duck came earlier this season against UCLA when the, the Bruins were driving for the win after Oregon had a 17 point fourth quarter lead. And has happened way too many times this year. We just let them right back into the game. And then, they're driving down the field. Dorian Thompson Robinson gets injured. He goes out of the game. Chase Garber's young, younger brother, I believe it's Ethan Garber's, comes in, and he's making some really big-time throws. He converted a fourth down. And then he does a freshman mistake, and DJ James, to his credit, made him pay for it. And he yeah. stared down just a quick little five-yard hitch. His eyes went right, stayed right, and James saw it all the way, made a great break on the ball, intercepted it, and ultimately won the game for – Oregon and we all breathed a, a collective sigh of relief so he, he's definitely a, a good player and I think Auburn fans will be pleased with, with what he's capable of doing but I, I don't think they'll be blown away he's good not great sure I was I was watching a little bit of Oregon's defense versus Washington from this season and he showed me a little bit. I agree with you on the boundary stuff. I don't think there's any question about that. I don't think he has the range to, you know, go to the field, but the, um, the ability for him to play inside as well. It seems like he's pretty good in run support or at least willing in run support. Is that something that you saw? Yeah, I think that he, he's definitely capable. You know, there are some corners who almost feel like they're better in run support. Sometimes I think he's still better in pass coverage than he is in tackling, but that shouldn't distract Tigers fans from the fact that he is definitely a capable player in, in that sense. And willing is, is definitely the word, right. you know, is he again, is he elite? No, but is he going to be helpful in that sense? Is he going to be able uh, to, to be competent or better in that department? The answer to me is yes. Yeah. Cool. Cool. All right. Let's, um, Let's talk about Jason Jones, the big 300-pounder defensive lineman. One, were you surprised when he left Oregon? And two, what can Auburn expect from a guy like him? Well, what you can expect is kind of hard to predict because he didn't play a whole lot. And he sort of reminds me of a lineman that, that I heard you talking about on a recent episode uh, that's transferring a former five-star guy who didn't didn't see the field a lot. I forgot what I forgot his name. Lee Hunter. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So kind of similar trajectory for for those two guys. Jones was a four-star, but he's a pretty highly rated four-star, yep. and he just never really clicked at Oregon. He never became a high-impact player. He wasn't even a regular starter on the defensive line. So I wasn't surprised when I saw that his name was in the portal, but I remember hearing about him coming to the ducks and thinking, is that going to be a guy who, you know, could replace Jordan Scott as sort of the, the anchor and the nose tackle in the middle of the defense. It just never panned out that way, okay. but sometimes for whatever reason, maybe it's scheme, maybe it's, you know, a, a variety of other factors or homesickness or whatever. Maybe it just wasn't ever meant to, to work out the best way it could have. And I think his potential is still there, but he hasn't shown that he's able to do what he's fully capable of at the collegiate level yet. But if he gets in the right system with the right team, then I, I think he's still able to do that, but he still has something to prove. Sure. Uh, all right. Last guy, Robbie Ashford, the quarterback, um, Hoover guy, which, you know, uh, folks throughout the state, you know, Either you love or you hate Hoover. There's no in between, but he, he won a lot of football games um, for Hoover, but didn't really see a whole lot of action with the Ducks. No, he he did not. And it was a guy who I, I wanted to see at some point because yeah. of you know how he was recruited. Again, another four-star quarterback, also a dual sport guy at Oregon. He played on the Oregon baseball team. And when you watch him run, you can tell he was a baseball player. You, you get immediately a little bit of the vibes that, that Russell Wilson and Kyler Murray give off with the way that they run. What and, position was he, Spencer, in baseball? Um, you know, that's actually a good question that I should know the answer to, and and I do not. But I want to say an in, I want to say infielder, like second base or shortstop. 
I could I could be wrong, but when he runs, you can tell that he's played more than one sport. I, I don't know how to describe that. I know that that's what it looks like, but outfielder. that's just was, yeah, that's according just to Oregon. He wasn't according to Oregon's website. He was an outfielder. He was he, he was an outfielder. Okay, so. Okay. He he is an athletic guy at quarterback. He knows how to move. He's got a pretty strong arm. And why he never saw the field, I think, was just a product of Oregon having a competitive quarterback room and yeah. the previous coaching staff's unyielding faith in Anthony Brown. And, you know, there were a lot of moments where fans wanted to see five-star recruit Ty Thompson, or they wanted to see Robbie Ashford or four-star Jay Butterfield, two of whom are still with the Ducks in the quarterback room. Right. I wanted to see him too because I want to know what what we have or what we had in him, and you know I still want to know what what we've got with Ty Thompson and Jay Butterfield. But I, I think a guy like Ashford, the the talent is there, the athleticism is definitely definitely there. I mean, when you watch his his highlight mixtape, you can see when he runs that he has got that sort of next level breakaway speed. Sure. I think it's just a matter of whether or not he can figure out the intangibles of playing the quarterback position and also, you know, being able to make the the throws that he needs to make as well. Right. Right. Uh, Spencer, one last question. And I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this because I think most Auburn fans don't care, but for the, the small folks that do, um, how is Bo Nix being welcomed as an Oregon duck? You know, there, there's mixed reviews amongst Oregon fans. I've gotten that, some, I, yeah. yeah, I've gotten some fan interactions on, on the pod, where, where people are uh, ranging from disgusted to excited to have him compete. And right. Dan yeah. Lanning has made it very clear. And I talked to Mike Jorgensen of the Oregon Sports Network, the color analyst for over 30 years for the Ducks on the radio. I talked to him about this, and he said that he has heard the same things, which is that it's going to be an open competition at every position, and quarterback is included in that. And there are some Duck fans who – you know, understand why Bo Nix come in. There's another segment, I think, who are just really wanting to see Ty Thompson because he's a five-star quarterback and we've heard his name for so long and we just sure. have this anxious energy about, can we get this guy? Can we just finally see what he is? Because we really haven't seen him for more than a handful of snaps during his time in Oregon. And so some people don't understand it, but some people see him as, you know, a, a veteran guy who did win games in the SEC and has an experience uh, in, in his past with Kenny Dillingham, and they're optimistic that that relationship can can yield some some pretty ripe fruit for the Ducks. But yeah. it, it seems like right now, anyway, before we've even seen him play, it's very similar to how Auburn fans felt about him. By the end, is you got people in all all sorts of camps. With, with a varying range of perspectives on, on Bo Nix. And I think it's going to be the most anticipated spring Oregon football game in quite some time. Yeah. You know, just hearing folks that have covered Auburn for decades, they all say that Bo Nix was the most polarizing player that they have ever covered for Auburn. I, I'm curious to see if that follows him to Oregon. Or if it was just because, you know, his dad was, a you know, he's a legacy and his dad used to play quarterback here and all that. And I I'm really interested to see. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. I, and I, I think that it's really likely that that's going to happen with the Ducks because of the season that we just had with Anthony Brown at yes. quarterback, who did a lot of good things, but had real limitations that we saw on the field. He didn't throw it downfield consistently. He, he couldn't pull the trigger on it on some, on some deeper throws and he wasn't always accurate going down the field and he checked it down, you know, more often than duck fans would have perhaps liked. And that created, you know, sort of the, these polarizing viewpoints about him as a player. Some fans never wanted to see him again. Some fans thought he was, you know, accepted him for, for what he was, but, if Bo Nix starts to show those similar sorts of inconsistencies, what you're going to see from Oregon fans, I think pretty widespread it is going to be a, a strong sense of, Oh my gosh, are we going to go through this again? Yeah. And I think they're feeling that way, frankly, because in the last 15 years, Oregon, Oregon ducks fans have been pretty spoiled at the quarterback position. And that's a credit to the program for continuing to bring in and develop pretty high level guys. But the quarterback position for Oregon has not had this much of a void in, in quite some time. You go back to Dennis Dixon, and then it was Masoli to Darren Thomas to Mariota 
to Vernon Adams. That That's as good a run of college football quarterbacks in 10 years as you're going to have. And it hasn't been as secure other than Herbert since then. So I think Oregon fans are just kind of feeling something that they haven't been accustomed to in the last couple of decades. Right. Spencer, thank you so much for your time, brother. Really appreciate it. How can Auburn folks listening or watching um, support you and your show? Anytime, man. Yeah, you can subscribe to Locked on Ducks wherever you listen to your podcasts or follow at Locked on Ducks on Twitter. And my personal handle is smalls underscore 55. And if you want to slide up in my direct messages and ask me a question, if you refer to me as smalls, I will answer to that because I always have. (laughs) Thanks, buddy. (laughs) Yeah, no problem. Thank you, Spencer. We'll talk about this Auburn and Kentucky matchup in just a moment with Lance Daub. But first, hey, this show brought to you by betonline.ag, the best place to place all of your sports betting. I know a lot of you use betonline.ag, and we really, really appreciate that. And a lot of you made some money last night because you guys bet on Auburn to cover. And so props to you guys. If you want to get on the action, head over to betonline.ag and use Promo code locked on when you make your first deposit, all one word, L O C K E D O N, to get a 50% welcome bonus on that first deposit. Bet online where the game starts. Time for a little crossover action, SEC basketball action with Locked On Auburn and Locked On Kentucky. Lance Daw, Zach Blackerby. Look, folks are calling this one, Lance, one of the more anticipated basketball matchups in the conference. In years, I mean, ticket prices for a seat in Auburn Arena and standing room only um, going up towards $300. This is, a, this is a hot ticket happening between these two teams Saturday. Yeah, absolutely. And I've been saying it on my show. This is one of the most anticipated matchups of the entire year, in my opinion, number two versus number 12. Like you just, just mentioned, I actually looked just a minute ago, standing room only, 260 bucks. That's the cheapest you can get right now. So this is going to be really, really exciting, this matchup between these two teams. There wasn't a lot of bad blood between these two uh, programs until Bruce Pearl came to Auburn. Yep. And I believe the five-year anniversary of Bruce Pearl defeating the Wildcats 75-70 to 70, uh, was just a few days ago, if I'm not mistaken. That's probably the was the monumental uh, program-building win for Auburn at the time. So yep. there's been a little bad blood since that game, and this has been a really fun rivalry. Yeah, and since then... Auburn hasn't really been afraid of Kentucky anymore. Like you said, I mean, that was a symbolic win and the mindset of the Auburn basketball program and the Auburn basketball fan and the Auburn basketball player has shifted a bit where it's like, okay, the big thing in Auburn basketball's ascension was, can you get past the Kentucky Wildcats? Then they did it. And then of course that happened in their run where they had to beat pretty much every blue blood to get to the final four a few seasons ago when that game went into overtime one of the better basketball games that I've ever seen. So as far as what's happening this Saturday, Auburn playing some of the best defense in the country. It seems like this team still has a chip on its shoulder from the, I think they believe that they should be the number one team in both polls. It did not happen that way earlier this week, but they understand how big this is. And Auburn is so good at home. It's tough to win for anyone in Auburn arena. Yeah, absolutely. Auburn's got a lot of momentum right now. And look, you look at that that game against Ole Miss. Ole Miss threw all the punches that they could in the first half. And like you mentioned, it's the defense for Auburn recently that's been impressive. Uh, giving up almost 66 points a game. But what really stands out to you is the efficiencies. Eighth nationally adjusted efficiency, according to Kim Palm. They're first in the nation in blocks per game, third in the SEC in steals per game. They do a lot of really good things on the defensive end, especially as games go on. Uh, Auburn kind of wears you down with their athleticism on the defensive end. I will say, though, this Kentucky team just dropped 107 points on what was at the time the second best team uh, in uh, defense, excuse me, in the country. So Kentucky right now playing very well on the offensive end, and they just got back Severe Wheeler, uh, their starting point guard, who was out for a couple of games with a neck injury. They're building a lot of momentum right now, and very similar to Auburn on the offensive end, they like to push the pace. They like to run in transition. They like to shoot the three. Uh, so these two teams stylistically, I think, are very similar offensively. It's just can Auburn wear Kentucky down? And honestly, I, I don't want to say I don't know if Auburn can because we've seen them do that so far this year. Um, but Kentucky is a different breed, I feel like. And so it's going to yeah. be a really interesting challenge for the Tigers. What do you think about the storyline with Wheeler and Katie Johnson? They will be matched up a ton in this game. These guys know each other well. Uh, one of the many storylines going into this one. 
Well, I definitely think that KD is going to to enjoy every second of it. I mean, we've seen him just go out of control at different points uh, this season. I've seen pictures of KD playing for Auburn, and it's literally like you can just see him screaming and floating in the air. It's just like he's, he's an emotional some, player. There's no question about it. Crazy dramatic picture. So I think the matchup between Wheeler and Johnson is going to be interesting. Wheeler, in my opinion, between him and Ty Ty Washington, Wheeler's the best guard, better guard in transition. So I wonder how Johnson's going to keep up with the pace that Kentucky's going, going to want to play with Severe Wheeler. I think the storyline between those two guys, obviously both playing at Georgia, is fascinating. But when you look at the individual matchup, offensively, I think Wheeler wins that battle, surprisingly, even though Katie Johnson's one of the better uh, defenders in the SEC. But when you look at what Katie Johnson brings on the offensive end, I mean, Wheeler's only five foot nine. So I think KD, if he wants to be able to kind of be diverse in what he does, if he wants to drive, if he wants to shoot, he's probably going to have his way with severe Wheeler. Uh, so both these guys, I'm looking to see them score a lot of points against each other, honestly. Yeah, I think that's going to be fun. And Lance, it's interesting. This is the first time I can recall where Auburn will play Kentucky and Auburn will have the best basketball player on the court. In your mind, what does Kentucky do to slow down Jabari Smith? Well, I think that Kentucky so far this year, they've done a really good job of shutting down star players. I can only think of one or two instances where they've not been able to do that. I think Kentucky is going to have to ask Keon Brooks and Jacob Toppin and Oscar Sheboy, those three different guys, to guard Jabari Smith at different levels of the defense. I think you're going to see Keon Brooks on Jabari Smith for the majority of this game if he's working on the perimeter. I think you're going to see either Toppin or Shibwe switch whenever Jabari wants to work inside. So I think it's a combination of those three guys that you're going to see against Jabari. And look, he's an incredibly talented player, a great jump shooter, shooting almost 44% from three right now. He's going to be incredibly difficult to stop. But I think what Kentucky is going to try and do is switch and apply pressure at different levels of the defense to see if they can get the ball out of his hands and get into somebody else's. You got a pick for this one coming up. I, I like Auburn at home in this one. I don't think it'll be pretty, but I think Auburn wins this one by three or four when it's all said and done. Look, something that Auburn has shown time and time again this season is resiliency. They've done they did it against Ole Miss, they did it against St. Louis. Um, they showed resiliency against LSU, a team that Kentucky couldn't beat uh, whenever LSU climbed back into that game. But Kentucky's on a little bit of a hot streak right hot streak right now. And I know that their strength of schedule is not the most impressive. But they've been building, and they've gotten some really big wins as of late. I'm going to take Kentucky to win this one by four or five. I think this is this is going to be a high-scoring affair. I think that Kentucky is going to be able to do a lot of great things with Oscar Sheepway. If you haven't seen, he's averaging over 15 rebounds a game, over 17 points a game. Absolutely phenomenal presence inside. I think you're going to see Kentucky get out and run, and it's going to frustrate Auburn at times. Even though Auburn's going to be able to score, I think Kentucky scores a little bit more. I'm going to go 84-80 is, is probably where I'm sitting with this matchup. Yeah, if it's fireworks, I like the Wildcats in this one. I, I agree with you there. And if Kentucky plays like they did against Tennessee, they can beat anyone in college basketball. But I think Auburn's defense slows things down a little bit. So it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun to see this one. And whoever wins this game, we said this about the Auburn LSU matchup a few weeks ago. Whoever wins this game has a really good shot at positioning themselves, uh, you know, as far as the SEC standings go for the remainder of the season. Lance, Auburn folks want to get a scoop on the opponent, a peek behind the curtain. How can they check out Locked On, uh, Locked on Kentucky? Well, they can follow the show on Twitter at Locked On UK. They can follow me on Twitter at Lance underscore. If you want to go check out the podcast, Locked On Kentucky, wherever you get your podcasts. And you can also check us out on our YouTube channel, Locked On Kentucky. Absolutely. Lance does great work over there at Locked On Kentucky. You can check out my show, of course, every single day, Locked On Auburn. I'm also on Twitter at C Blackerby. We'll be back tomorrow, both Locked On Kentucky and Locked On Auburn. You've been listening to the Locked On Podcast Network.